I got to find out some things from her. The last time I saw you, you were confused about who who God was. You were from Canada, and and uh, and I, I learned to love her. She's a very happy. I don't know how she's going to get through this talk. But he knocked at my door and I opened Revelation 3:20. A year ago today, Grace answered the Holy Spirit's call to come to Jesus after 20 years of faithful following Jehovah's Witness organization. She now knows true peace and joy. Thanks, Boy, it's, it's a pleasure. 25 years to be exact. 21 and a half baptized. Uh, 21 and a half baptized. 25. I forgot. I was supposed to kick out. I mean, <laughs> I was supposed to let the little children leave. Oh, I should go then. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> the children can leave right now if they want to. If you don't want to, you can leave. You <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> that's not yours, is it? Yeah, well, I guess it is. Okay, I'll let you have it. After all these wonderful speakers, I feel very inadequate, but I can only tell you my story. I, it's true that I was born a year today, and I was a breech birth. Believe me, I came feet first, and it took a long time. To tell you just a little bit about myself, I want to put one thing right about Bill. I want to thank you very, very much, Bill and Joan, for throwing out the net because I don't know what I would have done. But don't believe everything Bill says. <laughs> because he said that he has to relax people before he talks to them, especially Jehovah's Witnesses. I came green. I was a fully-fledged Jehovah's Witness. Kicked out. They kicked me out. I didn't believe in 1914. But I was still a Jehovah's Witness, and I was going to finish, finish everyone on my own. I was going to teach, preach the kingdom on my own. And he met me at the door and said, Erica introduced me as the Jehovah's Witness. He said, Jehovah, who's Jehovah? <laughs> I mean, how is that relaxing me? I felt like punching him in the eye. But I do love you, Bill, very much. What I have to tell you a bit about my life, I was, uh, this is going to sound weird, and, and Erica will vouch for it. She's always saying, Grace, you're weird. But that's okay. Uh, my father was an atheist, hated God, and my mother had a mental breakdowns. She was a religious fanatic, a religious mania. She was always in and out hospitals, and we were always put in one home or another. So I really didn't think too much about God. I went to, I was christened an Anglican by my gran. She took me to the Anglican church. And I went to Sunday school, back to Sunday school for a year, but until I was six. And when I say I've been knocking on doors all my life, that's the truth. The war came and I was evacuated. And uh, the lady that took us in had four of us. And she got fed up with us. And she told us, you know, she wanted us to go. The other mothers all took their kids home, but I was left. And she told me that my parents didn't want me, so I should find another home. So I went round knocking on doors. I was 12, to see if somebody would take me in. And somebody did. I was grateful for that. I stayed there till I was 14, and then I went home again. But I had been living in a very comfortable home, and uh, I had to work. I had to work very hard. But that was all right. I went home, but I was used to a lovely home. And my parents' home wasn't very lovely. So I decided to become a nanny, and I did. I wanted the best. So I became a nanny and went into all the rich homes and looked after the kids. But then at uh, 15, we had the Canadian Army invade us, and I flipped for a Canadian. And at 16, 
we got married. He was 19 and I was 16. And I was my, my Catholic friend. They will appreciate this. I was married in the Catholic Church. I had to. I was in no position to argue. They said if, uh, if I didn't get married in the Catholic Church, my husband and I would not be considered married. So I had to. And by the time I was 21, I had four children. But by the time I came to Canada in 19, and um, I'm sure you've heard about all those rotten war bride stories. Well, mine was one of them. Terrible. And I didn't know my husband really. We just saw him now and again on weekends. And when I came to live with him, I learned he was an alcoholic. And uh, it was very difficult living. So we didn't have much money. He earned $38 a, a week at that time, and which was very low. And I, with his drinking, we had nothing, nothing at all. So my mother would send me from England some material, and I would sit up half the night and make brooches and... Back I'd be knocking on the doors again, selling brooches. So I'm well trained for the witness work. But there came a time in my life when it got very bad with my husband, and I was contemplating divorce. But strangely enough, I really did believe there was a God, and that I had married for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and all that. And I didn't really want to get divorced, and I did love my husband. But uh, and I was praying. And who do you think came knocking? It wasn't the Avon lady. <laughs> and I said to them, what does your Bible say about divorce? Well, they opened it to Malachi. God hates divorce. Well, that was from the Bible. That was from God, I thought. And I was interested. So they took me in and they explained to me, you know, that if I was to show more of the Christ-like love, I might win my husband over. Well, you all know there's power in the Word. And I started to study from the Bible. Two weeks I studied from the Bible and I saw Corinthians where, with love, we could win our husbands over. And I was praying and I thought I would. I didn't notice it eroded into a book study. I thought I was still studying the Bible. And believe me, I was a 110% Jehovah's Witness. My husband did stop drinking, and I believe that's to prayer. But he hated my preaching, so instead of me being beaten when he was drinking, which he used to do quite often, he now started beating me for preaching. I'd been in the hospital with a fractured skull. I used to go to the Kingdom Hall with my black eyes, very proud, because a slave is not greater than his master. And I was doing Christ's work, I believed. And I really did endure, and everybody, the brothers and sisters, would be so proud, you know. Here she comes with her black eyes, you know, and that was a badge of honor. Such stupidity now, but at the time I was brainwashed. No, I was under mind control. There was two things they preached at that time. One was that Jesus did not have a beard. Well, they told me he was a man. So you have to have a beard. Most men say he was abnormal if he didn't have a beard. And the other was that Christ came invisibly in 1914. Well, I didn't believe either of those. And I said to my book study conductor, the girl that was studying with me, I said, I, I don't believe that and I won't get baptized because I don't believe that. I could see they were loving and kind people, but I'm not a, I don't usually get led astray. But anyway... Uh, the circuit servant came to see me. You know how important that is. I mean, the circuit servant. He came to see me and he said, Don't worry, Grace, you know, you're a good student. Don't worry about the beard and the 1914. God will put it right. So I thought, That's fine. I said, But I won't get baptized. He said, No, that's fine. And I was gung ho, out in the service, preaching, wherever I, I... I used to work for the Bay at one time and uh, they gave me my own little office and used to call me Jehovah. And I didn't mind. I, that gave me the opportunity to go back and show them in the Bible where I wasn't Jehovah. But anyway, um, it was a year after that that the watchtower came out and said, um, Jesus did have a beard. I don't know how they found out, but I was glad... <laughs> So I got baptized, thinking, well, God does put things right, so he'll put 1914 right. I knew he would, 
And I believed everything except 1914. I did tell Brother Ford, who was a very good brother, that I didn't believe it. And he said, don't worry about it. Maybe you'll be one that will hang on the skirt of Jew eventually, you know. But anyway, I persecuted and I got baptized on November the 13th. There was 13 13 baptized and it was in 1965. I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I believed it whole soul but then I felt truly felt that I saw I was one of these uh, witnesses that some of you witnesses will think oh, I used to pad your time were you any of the witnesses that used to count your coffee breaks <laughs> or put the watchtower in the window and drive all the way to Chicago and count time for it <laughs> I didn't like you guys I felt sorry for you, and I thought we had to be an honest organization. So I would put my own time in, and I'd pad your time. I'd do that on the side, because I wanted us to be a true organization. So I spent many hours when I knew a brother had done that, or a sister, and I would pad their time for them, thinking, well, we're keeping it a clean organization. I loved that. I had been picked up by the police. Uh, In Montreal, I was a witness, and at the time of Duplessis' uh, reign, Uh, witnesses were not allowed to preach and I came in just after that and we were picked up by the police and I'd be out with all the sisters and they'd say go on Grace you go so I'd go and witness to the police and convince them I'm a very good sales lady I'd convince them that they should go on another street and they'd say well why don't you go on the other street and then we won't get calls so we did we obliged and um, I talked to everyone you know how they told us they showed us how to preach to everyone we met. If I sat in the subway, I talked to the person next to me. I was really boring. <laughs> then my daughter, one of my daughters, I have three children and a son. My son doesn't believe in God uh, because he's had, we've seen a lot going in our family and I guess he figured if there was a God, he wouldn't have allowed me to be beaten like that. Uh, my eldest daughter was the one that fought me to the end. She was much against Jehovah's Witnesses. She's now a full-fledged Jehovah's Witness. She doesn't speak to me. She told me when I found out I was disfellowshipped. I told her I thought I might be disfellowshipped. And she said, Mom, I love you very much, but I love Jehovah more, so I won't speak to you anymore. I have two beautiful grandchildren, two beautiful black grandchildren, And a wonderful friend of mine, Brother Pitts, when he made the call last year, I just couldn't help it. I had to respond. But I have another daughter, and um, she she went to England and fell in love with a boy that lives next door to my mum, and she married. And it's devastating. I mean, this boy didn't even believe and she said, Mom, I've decided that I'd lose life and want to li- live with him. She was married. She said, I want to live with him for the rest of my life. Everlasting life, she'll give up for him. And she did. <coughs> Excuse me. And a year afterwards, she came down with cancer. She had Hodgkin's disease. And uh, the brothers and sisters told me that it was because she had left Jehovah. That's why she had cancer. And I excused it away by thinking, well, they're weak. They really don't know my God. And I had more knowledge and more love, so the more you have, the more is expected of you. So I forgave them for that, but I started lying. I started going home to my daughter and telling her, oh, brother so-and-so asked how you were, and sister so Nobody asked how they were. Nobody called her, sent her cards or anything. So I continued the lying, because I didn't want her to turn against God. I felt... If I lost my life for her, she was worth it. I can drink out of a brother's cup too, can't I? (laughs) Then I have another daughter that um, she had married a brother. I pressured her into it. They were seeing each other and you know that you're not allowed to see a brother on the side or... You've got to have a chaperone and all. You know how it is. You must need to look at him. You've got to have a commitment before you even go out with each other. And I put my foot down and said, you know, she really shouldn't be seeing him. And 
They said, I didn't want her to marry him. I said, no, he wasn't really baptized, but she was going to marry him whether he was baptized or not. She loved him. And she did. He did get baptized. And she had two children. When they were three and five, he left her for another woman. Of course, he was disfellowshipped, but he never supported the children, three and five. And she looked after them. And at that time, they were not allowed to take welfare. I don't know if they are today. But at that time, she couldn't accept welfare. She had to go to work full time to support the children, go to meetings, because if you didn't go to meetings, you were considered weak. Go out 10 hours a week, a month in service, with a heartache of being left. That was hard. That bothered me too, but that was just one of the things. And these things, as you're going through being a witness, you can see these things going on, and you still think, well, we're plodding on, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, we'll leave all the people that do bad things, and we'll just plod on. Then my eldest, my daughter with cancer, she was very ill. And I used to help her husband look after her. When one time I stopped counting time. Before this, I must back up a little. Before this, I stopped counting time because I thought God sees what I'm doing and I don't have to put that in the box. And the brothers came to me and said, you're not counting time, you must count time. And I said, no, the Bible doesn't say I have to put it down, how much time I put. He sees what I'm doing. He knows whether I'm doing what time. And they said, no, no, sister. They said, if you don't count time, we can see whether you are spiritually dying. That's our finger on your pulse, so that if you're not counting time, we know you're spiritually dying. Well, that sounded reasonable to me. I wish they'd counted the bumps on my head before I went in. (laughs) So I started counting time again. But while my daughter was so ill, I helped her husband look after her, and I had no time. Nobody came. I didn't see a soul. I could have been spiritually dead for ages because nobody came to see me. I knew that was just a story then. It was just made up. I have an outline here, so I have to keep referring to it. Um, Then, when my daughter was cured, we moved. There was a lot of problems in Montreal with the political unrest. So we decided to uh, move to Ontario. I had been a little weaker in service. I hadn't been making as many meetings. And when my husband said he wanted to move to Ontario, I thought this was Jehovah's will. I thought he wants me to get cracking again, so this was it. He was going to bring my husband into the truth. So I said to my husband, yeah, we will move, but um, he would have to drive me to the Kingdom Hall because I couldn't drive, and he promised me he would. And we moved, but we moved so far away from the Kingdom Hall that my husband wouldn't drive me. (laughs) And nobody else seemed to care about picking me up. But anyway, I did. And then eventually I talked him into it and he would come drive me to the Kingdom Hall and very angry. I suffered greatly in that time, I'll tell you. But uh, anyway, he did drive me to the Kingdom Hall. Then he was told that he had cancer, my husband. But while we were driving one day, uh, there was a radio program and it said on the radio program, this fellow was being interviewed and his name was, David Botting, is it Botting? Glenn, Gary Botting. Gary Botting. And he was being interviewed about a book he'd written, The Orwellian Mind of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the fellow said, are you excommunicated? He said, no. I thought, oh, I can read that. So I went and read the book, and I thought, oh, yeah, but I wouldn't admit it. It's true. You know, we are like Orwells, 1984. But I, I didn't, wasn't convinced. And then I mentioned it to a sister, and they marked me. She said, you know, you've been marked for reading a book. I mean, me. (laughs) I worked harder than any of them. (laughs) But anyway, then Gary, uh, I read Crisis of Conscience and thought, well, he's apostate. But some of it I knew was true, and I did love him. And I thank him so much for having a conscience. But uh, this, about a year before my husband died, I began to see the floors. I had a crack in my armor, as Lutz always puts that. He says when they get cracks in their armor, that's when you can get a little bit of truth in. So my armor was cracking. 
And uh, my husband was dying, and I looked after my husband until the day before he died. But for the last three months of his life, he wanted me to pray, and I really didn't feel I could. I really felt spiritually dying. But I was praying because I had to keep his eyes on the kingdom. And I was praying out loud, and he kept saying to me, why don't anybody come to see you? Why don't the brothers and sisters? Our house was always filled with pioneers, servants, and uh, why aren't they coming to see you? And I mean, how could I say it's because I've read a book? You couldn't do that. But uh, the brothers did come. My daughter, that was a witness, came down from Montreal and asked the brothers to come and see us. And the brother came in his lunch hour, and I asked him to pray, and he did pray. And he said, what a wonderful husband my husband had been, and really, it was the first time he'd met my husband. But do you know, that bothered my husband. When he left, he was very distraught. He said, they, they, God knows that's not true. How could he say all that? So I thought he needed to speak to Sabuni and thinking that the elders were special. When he came the next time, he came twice while my husband was dying, and I asked him to speak to my husband alone. And when he came out, he said, didn't speak to me about anything, he just said, your husband wants to be buried by us. And I thought, that's fine. But uh, he phoned me and he said, do you mind if I thank anybody that comes? Now, I've been 25 years one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, four people came that didn't know my husband, four witnesses. My dear sister at the back, that is still a witness, she came. And her husband, who is not a witness. And uh, another sister came, and that was the length of the people that came to his funeral. And if you had known, I'm sure you witnesses know in 25 years how many friends you make. But nobody came. I had three strikes against me. My daughter had left to marry a boy that was not a witness. My other daughter had become inactive because her husband had left her. And here I'd read a book. So that was bad. Um, after the funeral... Uh, I moved to be near my daughter, the one that had cancer. She was now cured and was expecting twins. Praise God. But I was really shaky at about 1914. So I was going to the Kingdom Hall, and I had mentioned to the elders that I, I never did believe in 1914. And they said, you've got to believe that. And I said, no, that's the basis of the Jehovah's Witness teachings. Well, I'd been weird all along, and I just thought this was God's channel. I didn't have to believe in 1914. God would put it right. So they came to, I wrote to, uh, I saw an article in the Watchtower that said, why are you disfellowshipping people who love Jehovah, love Jesus Christ, and believe in the Bible? And they answered, that was not enough. You must believe that, but you must also believe they are the faithful and the discreet slave. I believe that. That you mustn't take a blood transfusion. I'd had two major operations without blood. If anybody wants to get in touch with Dr. Palmer in Montreal, he said he'll never forget me. I drove him mad until he said, I'll do you. And he did. So I'd had two major operations without blood. And you must believe that Jesus came in 1914. I didn't believe that. So I wrote to Freddie. <laughs> Freddie didn't answer. <laughs> Don't know why. But I did have three brothers come and visit me. <laughs> and wanted to know why didn't I believe in 1914 and I told them why. I, I never believed in 1914. Well, I had brought many people in. I know we mustn't say that. We brought people into Jehovah's Witnesses. We didn't do that, did we? You planted, the pollers watered, and Jehovah made it grow. But listen, I brought people into Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> About ten of them. And it was sweat and toil, and my husband would beat me, and I'd, the phone would ring all day long, and he'd sit and mock me and say, Listen, if they've all found Jehovah, how come they've got to phone you? And that's the truth, isn't it? Who do we think we are? 
But three brothers came to visit me and said, look, we'll study with you and, and prove to you 1914. But I had read Ray's book by then and said, no. You know, I had read, I, that's what did it. I said, I've read Ray Franz's book. And they said, well, you know, and they left. And I wrote my letter. I knew I was going to be disfellowshipped. So I wrote my letter out for when they came back. I thought, well, I'll wait and see because surely they won't disfellowship me. I mean, <laughs> But they came back and told me that I had to believe it, and if I didn't believe it, that they would have to disfellowship me. They said, do you really believe we're the faithful and the discreet slave? And I said, if you disfellowship me, I'll know you're not. <laughs> I was disfellowshipped a week later. But when I said that I was distraught, I'm laughing about it now, but believe me, at the time it was hard. I sat there and cried to them and I said, look, what if I commit suicide? And he said, and he left. I haven't spoken, well, I have spoken to them since. Once they went to my son and my son has always said, mom, you should run for government, you're so honest and all this, you know, my root and party. But... Um, Jehovah's Witnesses called at him, his door after I was disfellowshipped and he said, oh, he said, I used to think you people were wonderful, but he said, when you kicked my mother out and what you've done to my mother and my sister, he said, I know that you're not honest. And they said, oh, she must have sinned. Well, my son doesn't think I sin, but he said, <laughs> not my mother. <laughs> he said, no, it was over something to do with 1914. And he said, oh, no, we don't disfellowship for that. So my son phoned me. And he said, Mum, you must have done something. And I, I was really upset. So I phoned the brother, Brother Luke's, and I said, Brother, I said, I don't care what you tell the world, but don't plant seeds in my son's mind. He knows me. And he said, I don't have to talk to you. And he hung up. And of course, I sat and cried. My other daughter, the one that had the cancer, phoned me. And um, she wanted to know why I was crying, and I told her. And uh, she phoned every witness in the book, you know, and uh, to tell him off. She phoned me back and said, give me his name, I'm going to phone him. And she did, and I believe she gave him a piece, piece, piece of her mind. <laughs> but then I started getting these books in the mail. And do I love you, <laughs> David Reed. <laughs> Comments from the friends. You'd read these and you'd go through them and you'd, yeah, I thought I was apostate. I thought I was Judas. I had, had had the pills to commit suicide. But I kept thinking of my daughter that was going to have the twins. She'd need my help. There's no way she could manage twins after being so sick. So I had to stay alive. But I waited for those comments from the friends so eagerly. And then I wrote to Ray Franz. And I love Ray Franz. He wrote me the most beautiful letters. Dunlop, Ed Dunlop, sent me the most beautiful tapes. And then I, Ed, uh, Ray Fran sent me some addresses of some people in Toronto. So I wrote to these people in Toronto, and they were out of the witnesses but not doing anything. But they gave me a name of a couple. I had heard about this couple, but other people that had been ex excommunicated. And uh, they gave me a name of a couple, Erica and Lutz Cocker. So I phoned them. And they said, oh, and very nonchalantly, oh, yeah, they would come over. Sure, fine. And this couple turned up. And, well, and you could see he was a apostate. He'd have had a beard. <laughs> and his wife kept sitting there saying, well, we, we have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought, they're weird. You reap what you sow, because she tells me that a hundred times now. But I did start to think, how come witnesses, she had had a blood transfusion too, which, I mean, I, that was really out. But then I, I started to think, she really meant it when she said she had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I knew the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray through him, don't we? He's our king. We know that. But I started to think about her, and I started to read Ray's book, 
David's book. Uh, Alinda Hall, I've never met her. She wrote me beautiful letters. I don't know who she is. She wrote me beautiful letters. Never, I don't know where she heard about me. If you know her, please tell her about me. And um, I started to be on my knees, day in and day out, crying. So sorry I couldn't do my arithmetic and work out 1914, but could I know Jesus Christ like they were talking about him? And it was really meant, I just didn't feel Jesus Christ, but I started to read the Bible, and I read Deuteronomy 18, False Prophets, Acts 1 and 8, and Jehovah being pierced, and I was really beginning to grow in the Spirit. Then they mentioned that maybe I would like to go to the convention in Pennsylvania. And I, I've always... Well, uh, before that, I had met, called some people. A fellow had been advertising in the paper. Do you need a friend? Would you like to read the Bible? I thought, well, this is my chance to go on studying the Bible with somebody. But, and the guy came. He's a very nice fella. But they were the two-by-twos, the Cooneyites. Lovely people. And... Uh, I mentioned I would like to go to, there was a, a Connecticut ex-witness meeting, and I mentioned I would like to go to that, but I didn't have the money, I priced it, and they said, well, we'll drive you. I didn't realize he wanted to go to get all these ex-Jehovah's Witnesses that were going to be in Connecticut. Uh, Ruth, or Ruth and Bill will attest to that, <laughs> because they were there too, and I latched them onto them. But... Um, I, they drove me all the way there and back for nothing. And it was very pleasant. They were very lovely people. But when I realized uh, who they were, through Laurie McGregor, really, I stopped that. But then they mentioned this convention. And I, many people had said, there are a couple of the people named Schwintz and Lippietz that are Christians that have been helping me. They said I should really go. So I left it in prayer to the Lord. And... Um, I prayed about it, but my car broke down, and it's a 79 Chevy, and it cost me 800 to get it fixed, so I knew I couldn't go. That was an answer from God. But uh, Erica and Lutz phoned up and said, you, you can come with us. It doesn't cost us anything, so you can come with us. And somebody put $50 under my door. Didn't know who. And a Christian phoned and said, look, we booked a room there, and uh, you can have it if you'd like to, to share it with Erica and Lutz. So I thought, well, this is an answer to God, from God. So I, I decided I would be going. But an ex-witness, Grace Nedlick, if anybody knows her from uh, uh, America, phoned me. Uh, Ray Franz had put me in touch with her. She said, don't go, they're all Trinitarians. So I phoned Eric and said, I'm not going. <laughs> so she said, why? And I said, well, they're all Trinitarians. She said, oh, are they? She said, H how do you know that? She said, wouldn't you have to speak to them to know what they believe? I thought, well, that's true, you know, so I'll go. So I came, feet first, and uh, Luke says he came with two graces, one coming and one going. <laughs> but I walked in the door and oh, they were selling literature. I mean, if that's not apostasy... And he took me over to this guy. I, Bill met me at the door. Who's Jehovah? <laughs> if I'd had a car, I would have gone home. <laughs> and I came and I sat in the same seat I'm sitting in now and I thought, oh, what a bunch. they holding their hands up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I mean, these are witnesses. They really had strayed. Poor souls. <laughs> and I was cross. Bill said, you came in. Yeah, I did. And we were introducing ourselves, and I stood up there, and I was crying bitterly. And I said, I miss my brothers and sisters. And there was this nice lady rubbing my back. And Bill said, you want to go back to the watchtower? And I said, I never said that. And I turned around to this very nice lady and I said, oh, that guy gets under my skin.
I didn't know it was his wife. And I sat there. The next day I sat there. Eric and Lutz took off. And I sat there. And believe me, the Spirit worked. Oh, I love you all so much. Brother Alton Pitts got up here. He and his wife. All of you were wonderful. But he got up here. And I tell you. My heart opened up like you wouldn't believe. And he made an altar call. And my heart was saying, go. Go forward. But I couldn't. And you know I'm not shy. <laughs> but I couldn't. And I said to the man sitting next to me, oh, I'd love to go forward. And he said, would you want me to go with you? And I said, please. And he did. And it's been wonderful. I'm 63. And can I tell you that the last year of my life has been the happiest of my life. I would like to add, I'm going over time I guess, <laughs> I would like to add that uh, since I've been a Christian. I would like to make an honourable mention to John Inglis. He has been provided me with all the books and tapes and everything that I need. And um, I would like to add that since I've been a Christian, the reporter, the record came and interviewed me and there was a full page picture on how I was disfellowshipped and why I was disfellowshipped. And I've had some most marvellous letters from Calgary, Vancouver, of people that are witnesses or studying with the witnesses or witnesses that have been hurt from Quebec. Um, I uh, was baptised October the 7th over radio. And um, I thank God and thank you. And my Lord, my King, my Saviour, I love him. Thank you. like that.